From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. I'm a woman who's made a good portion of her career in the field of horticulture, specifically in the journalism end of the plant world. But until I read the new book, The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the World of Plants, I hadn't really visualized myself as part of something quite the way that I see in its pages. A lot of gardening, and especially writing, is done on one's own as a solitary pursuit, but the book brings to life a sense of community and common purpose among the women portrayed, despite their different career choices from research scientist to floral designer to operating a seed company and more, and despite the fact that they hail from around the globe. We'll meet its author and learn more, but first this message. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. Today's guest, Jennifer Jewell, is author of the new book, The Earth in Her Hands, and is also the creator of the popular Cultivating Place podcast produced with North State Public Radio in Chico, California. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great, Margaret. Thanks for having me. Yes, this was a heroic, heroic effort. Seventy-five profiles. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was sort of heroic, but it was relatively easy because I I see all of these women as being heroes of mine, uh-huh. as uh, as that word is is very appropriate in this uh, setting, and so it came with some ease as well. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> um, we should be sure to say for local listeners here where I am that you're going to be visiting soon and that you and I and fellow garden journalist and author Marta McDowell, who's well known for her books about the gardens of Emily Dickinson and so forth, will be appearing with you to celebrate your new book March 9th at 6 p.m. in Salisbury, Connecticut at the White Hart Speaker Series for Oblong Books. And I'll give yeah. reservation information with the transcript, um, how people can get a ticket to come. And so that's going to be fun. We're going to be talking together about some of the things from the book and, um, and so forth. So the mission of the book, and I should say thank you for including me in the book, but the mission <laughs> of the book, <laughs> the mission of the book, how did you, what did you set out to do? Well, Timber Press originally came to me and said, would you be interested in writing a book on kind of the current state of women in horticulture? And I went away and thought, of course, yes, that sounds great, but why? And and how do you narrow that down? And um, we kind of came together to craft some parameters that included they had to be living women and they, uh, based on what I'm interested in in my podcast conversations, I wanted their work to represent sort of what you were referring to in your introduction, which were sort of greater intersections with other fields of interest or cultural and environmental concerns around the world, Mm -hmm. and to somehow be pushing the envelope of what horticulture means and how we see it and how we talk about it. And all of these women, including you, in my opinion, have done this. Mm -hmm. Well, um, (laughs) so you wanted to to showcase them um, and you asked everyone, I think you asked everyone the same questions and then kind of, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah. It was a a process that I really asked... um, People, I invited people to participate because I really needed them to commit to the time and attention needed to go through kind of a multi-step interview process wherein I sent them a set of questions. They wrote me the answers back, which was some amount of time for very busy women. And then I did a follow-up interview with each of them to kind of get more out of that and, and go deeper. A couple of the questions that were really interesting to me were how they saw some of these intersections, how they saw women's roles in these different areas of horticulture shifting over these last 25, 30 years, Mm. and 
finally, um, one of my favorite questions, which I think you and I have talked about before, is that final one where I ask each woman to give me a sense of women who inspired her and then women who are coming up in the field that they think the rest of the world should know about. And that way, I was able to cast a little bit of a broader net because to choose 75 women, Margaret, was really hard. And there are so many more that could and should be in this list. And so it's kind of an invitation for people to add their own names and amplify those voices. Well, and that um, that little kicker you asked each of us about other inspiring women. I loved that was one of the parts of each profile in reading the book uh, recently that I loved the most because it got me, oh, right. Oh, wow. I remember her. Oh, her book was so great. Oh, I visited her garden 20 years ago. You know what I mean? It was like, and then there were all these people that I'd never heard of. And I immediately am like Google searching like a mad woman, you know, to find out who's that? Who's that? That person sounds really interesting. So it was this it was this who, who's who, but it was also this like tri- all these tributaries to other who's, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it was really it was that was one of my favorite parts. Um, yeah, yeah. So fun. Um, I I was uh, uh, I in the, in the in the back of the book as in most books the, there's like a little author bio kind of thing and a picture of you and. <clears throat> It seems like you didn't have much choice yourself based on your mother and father on what you'd be doing. Tell us about your kind of inspirations that you grew up with. I'm asking you the questions now. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about mom and well, dad. <laughs> right. My mother was a professional gardener and um, a garden designer, florist, big native plant lover, uh-huh. uh, especially in her floral and garden design work. And we, I grew up, I was born and raised at 8,000 feet in Colorado. And so it was kind of tough gardening terrain. And my father was a wildlife biologist. All of my extended family came from the, the Northeast or England, but my parents had migrated west for my father to do his Ph.D. work at the University of Colorado oh. uh, in Fort Collins, or Colorado State University, Fort Collins. And so... This idea of gardens and plants and native ecosystems and environments was definitely part of our just everyday conversation and what we spent our weekends doing and our vacations hiking or, um, so it was, it was definitely part of my upbringing and the language I learned, but not, it, it wasn't. Something that had to happen, so that was nice that it organically happened for me. That I just and you know this feeling, Margaret. I just got that gardening bug. Like yes. I, when I first started gardening at my own little space in uh, Seattle, Washington, in the Ballard neighborhood, um, with a young family, I just it was the thing I woke up every day thinking about. Like, what's going to grow? What can I plant? What am I going to do in the garden today? Yeah, and it was interesting then. I mean, I I knew my own, you know, I had a grandmother who gardened, and she was my inspiration. And, um, you know, and I, I, again, in the back of the book, I read yours. um, You had these two parents who who connected you with nature and so forth. Um, You know, but then to read all these other women and what got them going and so forth, it it was also very interesting. And they've taken a real diversity of career paths. I mean, there are scientists mm-hmm. in the book. There are, you know, all kinds of. I mean, there's a real wide range of, um, of 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 people. Yes. Yes. Which I that was one of the first things that I did when when I you know was trying to compile my list was trying to. I did a you know a funny little like Gantt chart of what <laughs> were the fields that I considered to be teaching us or informing us about what gardening and plants are. Like where did we learn? And 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 how did we pick up information even when we didn't know it? So, you know, there's garden writers and garden photographers and plant hunters and breeders and but then there are the more kind of less obvious things like garden photographers and how they frame a picture and how those pictures then inform us on what is beautiful or what relates to what. And um, 
And then the public policy and administrators were really important yes. to me to see like at those levels of how are we getting policies in place on any of these these areas. And the herbalists and traditional uh, ecological knowledge sort of holders in these places and the, the culturally resonant voices in the field today were just so exciting to me. Yeah. So it is it's a real diversity and of ages and um and 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 again locations, ethnicities. I mean it's it's a mix of people, a real mix of mm-hmm. people. Um there were many familiar faces in the book, familiar to me, and also as I said before, many unfamiliar ones that I was sort of glad to meet, you know, in mm-hmm. in pages. Um Familiar often meant sort of people I've ordered plants from <laughs> who I feel like I know or I actually have met some of them, um, right. like Ira Wallace, for instance, um, and maybe you can tell us. Uh, she's been to my garden. I was a, an original customer of the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. You know, I've known them forever. Um, but Ira Wallace, for instance, tell us a little bit about her. She's in the book. So Ira Wallace is um, has been a guest on, on my program in a Seed Keepers series that yes. I did. And her work with the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange down in the southeast is really interesting in terms of heritage plants, plants of the African diaspora, and plants specifically well-suited to the southeast climate. She also, though, is is really interesting in that she is instrumental in putting on a uh, an event at Monticello uh, there, Thomas Jefferson's uh, estate in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, called the Heritage Harvest Festival in, in, the, in the autumn. And I think I'm, I'd have to go look it up, but I want to say that's been going on for maybe seven or eight years. Oh, yeah, um, at least. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember exactly when it yeah. was, when it was yeah. started, but... Iris with Ira was instrumental in getting this started and trying to provide a forum for a diversity of people to come together in this um, this very interesting space, which is both rich with history and very very complicated with history. Yes. Um, yes, and no, those are some. Uh, she's also uh, on the Seed Keepers Exchange. Um, uh, board or has been in the past, and so her voice is really informing a lot of what we know about heritage seeds today, even if we don't know that her voice is there. Informing exactly, it. exactly. And then, um, speaking of seeds, so Renee Shepherd, um, and she, for I want to say thirty-five-ish years, maybe has been a seed company person, and she has. Uh, first, I think it was Shepherd Seeds, and I think she sold that, and then it's Renee's Garden Seeds. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Uh, you know, I, yes. Yeah. And she is fascinating. Her stories about the industrial seed world, yes. sort of larger scale, and just how few women were in that field, and really still are on international levels, was fascinating. And to for, to hear her stories about being, for instance, at trials of food, uh, crops that were being grown out for seed, and the different ways that she approached how she evaluated a trial versus how the men in the environment at that time <laughs> were evaluating them really made it clear to me, this was like a perfect illustration, Margaret, of how, um, whether it's you know, gender-related, whether it's acculturated, I don't know the answer. I am not a sociologist. That's not why I was here. But was interesting in terms of having women at the table in any field shifts how things are perceived Mm -hmm. and how they are valued. Mm -hmm. And they change the conversation just Mm -hmm. by pure representation of different experiential backgrounds. Yeah. So someone who else, someone else I feel like I know, um, a familiar face who, in fact, grows a lot of things, especially ornamental things from seed, um, to share with us and ships plants around the country is Annie Hayes, uh, Annie's Annuals, and she sells annuals and perennials and biennials and so forth. Um, many of the listeners will know a- Annie's Annuals. They may not know Annie Hayes. I think she's been doing that for like 18 years or something. Yeah. So there she was, and she's different. Um, 
effusive and 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 so energetic and right. yeah, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, she is just her, her enthusiasm and her descriptive uh, like ebullience is just yeah. contagious. Yeah, and um, and she really changed like at a time right around two thousand ish that sort of period right there. She changed a mail order nursery kind of concept, and she certainly changed what was a successful formula for a retail nursery as as nurseries were consolidating the specialty smaller ones here in the West. Yes. And, and they were consolidating and growing bigger plants that had to flower, and they were becoming, you know, owned by larger corporate names. Amy Hayes was very, very successful at finding a niche that relied on small plant sizes, seed-grown varieties, hard-to-find but common plants in many cases, especially in the beginning. And now she has just a fantastic selection of um, well-grown, well-trialed uh, annuals and interesting perennials. Yeah. Um, other familiar faces included, of course, because I've been a garden writer a long time, some garden writers and among those, there were some great quotes, for instance, one from the prolific garden writer Amy Stewart. She says, get us out of the lifestyle section and as far away from home decorating as possible. We're talking <laughs> about how we interact with the plant kingdom, not how to choose a throw pillow. And I laugh especially because I worked for Martha Stewart for so long, and I also love and appreciate the value of knowing what's a good just right throw pillow. So, I, yeah. But I love that quote. It's like... You know, we're in all these fields, and and <laughs> and we're connecting to plants in all these ways, um, yes, not yes. just aesthetically. And and another yeah. from uh, from the writer Jamaica Kincaid, she says, "Plants contain the world. The garden, better than any college education, gave the world to me." And I just yeah. that just makes me shudder. I just loved that. So so there were also yeah. like these statements, you know, from each of the people, the 75 women um, that you profiled, which was kind of fun. Um, mm -hmm. One of, uh, actually, it was it was Amy Stewart, I think, who, um, in her little uh, Other Inspiring Women list at the end, she praised another woman who's in the book, Deborah Prinzing, founder mm -hmm. of the Slow Flowers Movement, and, and she, for, for having had this idea and sort of a one woman saying, what one, what one sort of admiring her for what one woman can accomplish, uh, devoting herself to the cause of American grown and seasonal flowers. So tell us a little bit about Deborah because she's a standout, I think, too. Well, and that interconnection that you just mentioned really happened so frequently with these women, where one would have an idea that then triggered one or two of the others or, or crossed over in some way. So there really was this interconnected web, even with women who sometimes didn't know each other. Now, yes. um, Amy Stewart and Deborah Prinsing did know one another, and it was Amy's Flower Confidential and this sort of expose on on just what the, the environmental and physical cost to our world were of our incredibly over-imported flower industry in the United States. And a couple of things happened at that same time. You saw Aaron Benzikane, whether it was a direct sort of inspiration or not, uh, there was this collective consciousness of we need more locally grown, organically grown flowers. Yes. And Aaron Benzikane sparks this flower farmer revolution across the country. And Deborah Prinsing then starts this phenomenal flow, slow flowers society and movement, starting with a book about a 50 mile bouquet and how do we, how do we source our flowers? How do we find out where they came from? Just the same way that slow food had sparked this interest in our food. Um, and asked all of us to just have a little bit more awareness and accountability as to where we spent our dollars and what industries we were supporting so that we were less complicit in um, industries that were harming people and environments and economies around the right. world. Right. Um, some other examples are sort of 
amazing what woman can what one woman can accomplish kind of things. And I suppose everybody in the book has a little bit of this. But there was a, a plant pathologist. Um, I think she's actually a young woman, probably Kristen Wickert. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it was among her things that she's worked on in her PhD, for instance, she focused on a native biological control for the incredibly invasive tree of heaven for Ilanthus, right? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so so it could be that kind of a root that's determined and, 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 and hard. It's not easy, but determined and s- the stick to you know, the patience to keep pursuing mm-hmm. it. Um, um, or there was another one I wonder if you could tell us just about for a couple minutes, Vandana Shiva, uh, the environmental health and social justice advocate from India who's especially a preservationist. I think of her as a preservationist of biodiversity and seeds um, and activists yes. there. And she is listed as a an inspiration to a lot of the women yes. in the book. Yes. Her work, starting in India uh, after some just serious environmental devastation and um, crises of contamination, um, a big fire in a agro-industrial chemical plant that was producing fertilizers for fields really sort of inspired her to act and to take a lot of um, research and protest and action forward in the world. And, And what she, you know, as she was catalyzed by this event, she became very aware of how her country's um, growing it, uh, population, not not like increasing population, but the people who grew things yes. on the ground had become entangled in this just incredibly crippling web, um, in a bad way web rather than a good way web, of being indebted and tied to this agro-industrial complex, which in which they had been told that, you know, they needed to add, plant these seeds to have increased productivity, but these seeds needed to be fed with these fertilizers, which then killed the soil and polluted the water. And this, you know, it it became worse and worse and worse. And she uh, really went to the, the mat, as it were, to save these traditional growing methodologies and techniques of the people in her place, and it became a global call to um, re-energize and um, re-affirm traditional ecological knowledge starting from where she was. And, you know, it starts for her at the seed and the soil level. And so, um, for instance, she took someone very large to court <laughs> over the patenting, because it could have been the seed company, the patenting of a particular plant, and said, you cannot patent this. This is a living, naturally occurring biological plant. And it was the neem plant, I believe. Yes, it was. And, yes, yes. And she won. Yes. And, um, and that was precedent for the whole rest of the world to see and say, one woman can accomplish a lot with her heart and her head yeah. in full alignment. Yeah. Well, she's a real warrior, Vandana Shiva. Yeah. And she's really the hero of all, virtually all my young, younger uh, seed farmer and seed breeder friends. Um, she's one of their the people they that they admire the most. So, you know, she, she's someone that I think a lot of as well. Um so, yeah, so um, with the transcript of the show about the earth in her hands, your new book, uh, Jennifer Jewell, I'm going to, again, f- tell local uh, readers and listeners also how they can come and visit with us at the event at um, the White Heart from Oblong yeah. Books and so forth in March. And, um, yeah, I appreciate your taking the time, and you're about to head out on tour all over the place, aren't you? <laughs> I am. So I'm hoping to... Um, uh, enjoy meeting so many people out on the road and talking more about this because uh, it's just, it's really energizing to, to me as well. Well, and we've only hit on a few and there are 75 in the book and each one is an interesting <laughs> story. So there you go. Lots to talk about. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Margaret. Okay. I appreciate it. See you soon. Okay, bye.
Bye. Underwriting support from High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving organic gardeners and farmers with 100% organic and non-GMO vegetable, herb, and flower seeds. HighMowingSeeds.com slash Away to Garden. And I hope to see you all again soon, too. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to garden and happy gardening meantime a way to garden with margaret roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest npr station in the nation robin hood radio